Um, yes, so thanks very much to, to Lori, uh, to uh, uh, Vanessa, to Heather, to everyone that's helped out with this project for inviting me along and for engaging uh, with the Understanding Unbelief project. I think this, it's fantastic. There are multiple projects going on around the world at the same time, overlapping in different ways in a space that not too long ago, there wasn't a lot happening in. So I think these are, are very exciting times as a researcher in this space, and I'm happy to be a part of it and, and very happy that, that uh, you all in, invited us along. So in May of this year, Lori, Conrad, myself, and many others had the chance to attend a really interesting event at the Vatican. It was an event focused on uh, unbelief in scare quotes, so think uh, atheism and agnosticism there, from a social scientific perspective. And that's where we launched this uh, preliminary report, Understanding Unbelief, Atheists and Agnostics Around the World, which is uh, what I'll be presenting today. Now the report is the result of a, a large international research effort on atheism and I might say non-religion. And I would argue it presents some interesting and perhaps encouraging findings in an increasingly polarized world. I know a part of this project that you're engaged in here is thinking about religion and non-religion cooperation to solve problems. And hopefully what I'm going to tell you gives some optimism in relation to that. At least it, my view of the data is suggestive of, of optimism. So we launched this report in Rome on the 50th anniversary of the first academic conference to be held on the topic of unbelief. So that was hosted by the Vatican in 1969. And that was hosted in the wake of the establishment of the Pontifical Secretariat uh, for Nonbelievers. And that was one of the many efforts that the Vatican made after the Second Vatican Council to encourage interreligious dialogue. But they faced a challenge in that data on unbelievers was pretty minimal at the time. So they gathered the social scientists that were around and tried to, to do their best. Uh, but having more data, which thankfully we have much more now, is not the only thing to change since 1969, right? So since 1969, we've seen substantial growth of the religious nuns and unbelievers. Uh, we've had a flourishing of secularist activism and non-religious cultures and ongoing policy debates in these areas. So just really quickly on, in grounding us in some examples, this is just one example from the UK of the growth of the religious nuns. This is a different version of a chart that I think we saw yesterday, where you can see the, the top color is the non-religion, where it was around 30% or so in uh, 1983, but then crossing over the 50% arc in, in re the recent British Social Attitudes surveys. Um, specifically in relation to uh, non-belief in the existence of God or an absence of belief in the existence of God, Norris and Engelhart bring together a variety of data sets from you know, around 2004 or so, to show this decrease in levels of belief in God across numerous countries over the last century. So you see it's from 1947 on the far left over to 2001 on the far right. And those are some, some pretty hefty uh, drops that you see there. Um, and that produced this sort of global situation that Phil Zuckerman tried to document in 2007, where he noted that at that time, depending on how you want to define the terms, and we can argue that, you know, quite, quite extensively. There's at least somewhere between 500 and 700 million people in the world who are either atheist, agnostic, non-believers in some type of, of personal God. And I think you could make a compelling argument that there are many more uh, than that as well. Um, beyond the sheer numbers, we've also seen this flourishing of organized atheism and humanism and a number of public campaigns for a diverse set of humanist, atheist, and secularist causes. It might include the humanist bus campaign in the UK, uh, the Reason Rally in the United States, and rallies in support of secular bloggers in Pakistan. It might all be a part of that discussion. Uh, we've also seen the rise of online and offline media, this phenomenon of new atheism, thinking Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens, and others, uh, campaigning against religious belief, right? As well as the, we've also seen the expected religious responses, as a great many people view these new atheists as a threat and sort of rally the religious troops to, to meet them. And it's produced what I think is a rather polarized discourse in this area, where it's a sort of battle over how religion and, and atheism, really. Um, 
And that flourishing of unbelief has also produced difficult questions for, for governments around the world, including uh, UK policymakers deciding whether or not to, to recognize humanist marriage or to who qualifies as a humanist when they seek asylum. So this is uh, Hamza bin Waliat. I don't know if, if you all are familiar with that case. So he applied for asylum in the UK in 2017 from Pakistan, arguing that he faced persecution from blasphemy laws and would potentially face the, the death penalty. Um, his application was rejected from the United Kingdom on the grounds that he did not know enough about Plato and Aristotle. That was their understanding of what humanism was and how one would be to say, are you really a humanist and shall we let you this, this in? Uh, so that was a rather bizarre way of making that, that judgment. Uh, but I am happy to say that was 2017, but Hamza was granted asylum through a, a very large campaign uh, earlier in, in 2019. Um, and of course, those developments in all things unbelief, uh, let's see, I missed a slide here, just to say the ongoing policy debates go the other way as well. So you can look at contemporary China and a sort of uh, non-religious government and how do you regulate religion. Uh, so there's the issue of Islam in the west part of, of China, and so we're hearing a lot about camps and a lot of issues there. But also in the city of Shaman, the, the local um, Communist Party uh, members had a real crackdown on what they considered superstition. Uh, around the city of Shaman, and we're really monitoring party members for signs of superstition. Uh, so that the government uh, regulation in relation to religion and non-religion can cut both ways. So those developments in unbelief haven't taken place in a vacuum, right? Concerning religion in general, we've seen what Peter Berger calls the desecularization of the world since 1969. Religion didn't pass away, as many either feared or hoped, uh, but rather changed away from mainline denominations towards New Age spirituality and, and fundamentalism. And of course, we've also seen the events of September 11th and their ongoing repercussions in foreign policy and in the lives of millions of people around the world. Uh, we've also seen more broadly since 1969 a steady rise in economic inequality across a great many countries. Uh, we've also seen uh, the end of the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union and followed now by rising tension between the U.S. and China in terms of economic might and global influence. We, and I say that with hope, so some of us have seen the challenge and the seriousness of climate change and, and our seeming inability to address it. That's become something that's very much on the table. Uh, we've also seen the IT and connectivity revolutions of the internet and social media forming new socialities and entrenching old ones. We've also seen the continued rights, rise of rights discourses, both offline and online, concerning the rights of minority groups, of which unbelievers or the non-religious are just one. And in the midst of all of that change, we've seen, fortunately, a, a flourishing of academic work on all things unbelief, non-religion, and secularism. So around the time of that first conference, there was work. They were able to get a conference together, but the way I, I phrase it is the pickings were slim uh, in, the, in the late 60s. And we've seen quite a lot of growth in that, that area where we've seen hundreds, perhaps thousands of publications on these topics, uh, a scholarly organization, specialist journal, themed book series, Cambridge, Oxford, and Blackwell's handbooks, and well-attended academic conferences, and grants, yay for grants. We get, to, we, we get some of those. Uh, now, all that work is great, and it's certainly increased our understanding of all things atheism and non-religion, but most of it is done in the West, and with people who are either quite vocal about their atheism, or members of atheist and humanist organizations, who are consequently, I would say, unlikely to be representative of unbelievers as a whole. So it's focused around things like the New Atheism and people that are into that, organized non-religion groups like the Sunday Assembly, and research uh, also seems to focus on weird people. It, it, can, am I introducing the concept of weird to anyone? Because if, if, if so, yes, okay, it's a fun one. Okay, so it's Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. So those characteristics which think of North American undergraduate students. Uh, in terms of the history of humankind and the present diversity of humankind, they're weird, <laughs> right? Like they're, that's not the norm, but somehow we're using research on this particular group of people to make general inferences about humankind. Bad idea. Yes, Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. It was coined by uh, an anthropologist slash psychologist slash economist, Joe Henrich, along with uh, Aaron Zion and Steve Heine. 
uh, and so that you can find some uh, some really rich work on what has made weird people weird uh, and uh, how it manifests itself across a variety of domains of life. So that's something to, to check out. Um, okay, so that's where we see the Understanding Unbelief project stepping in. We, had, we designed the Understanding Unbelief program to get beyond both the convenient but likely non-representative samples of vocal atheist and organized non-religious uh, uh, individuals and to do and encourage research outside of weird settings to better understand uh, atheism agnosticism in the world today. So it's a three-year program of research uh, funded with 2.3 million pounds from the John Templeton Foundation and based at the University of Kent and led by Lois Lee, myself, Stephen Bullivant, and Miguel Farias. Uh, and we're trying to bring together several disciplines to develop this better descriptive account of the nature and the diversity of atheism and agnosticism around the world. So just briefly, elephant in the room, unbelief. So the story here, right, is that it, it was originally in the application non-religious belief. Reviewers didn't like it. And so we said, well, and we, we, we still hold to this conclusion, there's no good word in this space that actually does the job, right? And even when you talk to your uh, informants and your participants, uh, still not a good word, right? Like there's no agreed upon word in the space to be found. So we said, well, let's pick an obviously really terrible word that we want to move beyond. And we chose unbelief for it. And that's kind of got us into trouble because we, even though we say that we don't take the term seriously, it gets thrown around still, right? So we might be contributing to the problem. So we're going to switch to atheism, I think, for the next project. A different set of problems arise, but perhaps not as bad as this one. Uh, but let me just say, uh, in terms of operationally, when I talk about unbelief in this presentation, this is what I mean. I'm talking about people who, on the ISSP question, which statement comes closest to expressing what you believe about God, so we've got data on this from a number of countries, we're talking about the ones and the twos, right? So ones, I don't believe in God, so those are, for the purposes of this presentation, that's what I mean by atheists. And those that answer number two, I don't know whether there is a God and I don't believe there is any way to find out, we're calling those agnostics, right? And so there's a, we had a discussion on would you include number three in unbelief? Interesting conversation to be had, but just, so, just to know that we, we went conservative, we kept with one and two, and that should be taken into account in all of the, the conversations, right? Um, so now this raises the issue of what do you mean by God, right? <laughs> so God is in this question. Uh, so rather than taking on that issue and, and really giving what should be taken as the proper definition of God, uh, especially across different languages, something that is above our pay grade, we used the translations of the World Value Survey, not to duck the challenge, but to be able to dialogue our findings with theirs, right? So in relation to China, there was an interesting story that we had with China. We spent a lot of time on the translation process, working with different groups of Chinese universities on this. And so the, the way the, the World Value Survey uh, plugs in four distinct terms every time the question is asked, right? Um, and it, the rough translations are sort of Buddha, Allah, God, or this term Shen Meng or Shen Leng, so spiritual phenomena. And it was really interesting in the design of the process where we had many people say, oh, if you include Shen Meng in your, you think no one is an unbeliever. You will have no one say one or two to Shen Ming because this vitalistic conception of the universe is just throughout Chinese culture and thought and everyone's gonna hold to it. We didn't find that. We found plenty of people checking one and two for it. So some of the uh, interesting debates about religion and non-religion in China, uh, uh, I think we can speak to them a bit through some of this, this data, right? And in, for, for Japan, we use the, 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 the term kami, uh, which has indigenous uh, local meanings, but also uh, for Japanese people, especially if you're from the outside of Japan and you say the word kami, they think Judeo-Christian God, uh, even though it is a, a local term. So they learn of like, why are people mentioning this? Why? Because it's just not normally talked about in Japan. You just don't talk about these things. Uh, so if people are talking about them, it's like, why are they talking about them? Probably about to be missionized. That <laughs> seems to be the, uh, the, the understanding in, in Japan. Okay, so our, our goal in this space then is to better understand the nature and the diversity of unbelief. Right. So what configurations of unbeliefs do we find? 
uh, it's normally used in relation to God or gods, but there are many other supernatural beings and phenomena that substantial percentages of the general population believe to exist or believe to be true. So logically, unbelief in God need not entail unbelief in these other things. And we wanted to look at the extent to which unbelievers agree that various supernatural phenomena either exist uh, or are true. Uh, we wanted to get uh, their attitudes toward different religions and religions as a whole, so whether they were pro and anti-religious. And just to say now, because it's, it's, we actually don't include it in the report, we don't have uh, the data all analyzed yet. We do have a lot of, ex of um, questions about identity, uh, practice, experiences, uh, and, and connections there. So, so even though unbelief is the focus of the survey, that's not the entire entirety of it. So we will be able to dialogue between these different areas that people find of interest, the, the beliefs, right? We're interested in what worldviews and values unbelievers have. So humanism might be one, Marxism another. My new favorite is transhumanism, sometimes written as H+. For those of you not familiar with it, these are the folks that think that it's something that human beings can and should do to use new technologies of genetic engineering, virtual uh, reality, um, artificial intelligence uh, to overcome death uh, and constraints on our freedoms, basically to radically overhaul. It's basically what I said to, to Graham, it's the human separatist project on steroids. <laughs> is what it is. Uh, so it's, and uh, most of those folks are non-religious. There are religious transhumanist groups, but a lot of these folks are, are non-religious and, and view themselves as becoming gods, right? So I find that a very interesting idea and worldview to look at. We want to know what does unbelief look like for people who aren't rich white men who are doing a lot of the talking and a lot of the publishing in these areas, right? So by, by getting away from the groups, we can hopefully uh, get to some of these voices. And what does unbelief look like outside of Euro-America? We want to know that. So there's, we go, Western educated industrial. So if you needed to, if you still need to, to write it down, there it is. So we, we want to do all those things. Now, four people and a couple of disciplines can't do all that by themselves. So we had a sub-granting program, fortunately, uh, that we uh, gave funds to 22 research teams, so a total of 45 researchers from four continents uh, working across a number of human science disciplines. And so this ends up being our geographical coverage. Uh, that it, not, not on all aspects of the project, but on, so somebody's funded project is in all of the darkened Country. So we're going to have some relevant data on these spaces, and well, we have the data now from these from these spaces. So we get at least some good geographic uh, coverage. But now the report that I'm outlining is focused on these six countries, which we did a big combined multi-method uh, study. Uh, so this was the U.S., Brazil, the U.K., Denmark, China, and Japan. We chose these countries uh, not just for access, but levels of atheism and agnosticism, background religions and cultures, uh, anti levels of anti-religiosity, and social uh, policies surrounding religion, right? And we wanted to use both qualitative and quantitative methods to get at these things, recognizing the strengths and weaknesses of, of each. So in relation to um, uh, the quantitative side of things, we ran nationally representative surveys of around 1,100 people per country. So a sample of 900 folks where we only had the ones and twos in there, and then 200 general population. And we set the sampling frame for the unbelievers based on existing research from the ISSP and World Value Survey to get a demographic profile. So we set quotas in relation to age, uh, sex, and region of the country to say, it looks like the picture of, you know, the where are the unbelievers and who are the unbelievers coming from existing research, that structured our sample for this so that we can say, this is relatively representative or has a better chance of being representative of ones and twos in these countries. And then we, we conducted uh, 30 in-depth interviews in each of those six countries, 10 interviews in three different uh, regions, and we tried to, to aim for maximum variation in demographics. Now with 30 people that you can't be perfect in relation to this, but it was, okay, too many older folks, too many men, too many this, too many that, uh, to try to balance this out so that we hear some different uh, voices. Uh, so I've just got to give uh, credit to our, our fantastic uh, RAs and interviewers across these different countries who worked very, very hard in, in uh, working with us and, and pulling this off. And so the result, the report.
but what you want to hear, the data. So getting to that. Uh, so we were able to, to put this report together from that. So on the nature and diversity of unbelief, first thing you'll say, so I'm just going to focus mostly here on the contra stereotype ideas. I think that's the sort of message I want to get out there today. So popular assumptions about unbelievers as convinced dogmatic atheists do not stand up to scrutiny. So we ask people to uh, rate their uh, levels of confidence that their beliefs in the existence of God are the correct ones. And hopefully, you can, well, yeah, it's kind of small here. Uh, the squares are the, uh, the atheists, the triangles are the agnostics, and the circles are the general population, right? So first, agnostics tend to have the least confidence in their views. So from uh, minus 2.1 in Japan to plus 0.13 in the UK, and that's perhaps not unsurprising with the nature of, of agnosticism. Uh, but second, contrary to some popular suppositions, being an atheist does not necessarily entail a high level of confidence or certainty in one's views. All six of our country's atheists express overall levels of confidence in their beliefs about God's existence, either notably lower than the general population, so that's in Brazil and in China, or broadly comparable, so that's in Denmark, Japan, the UK, and the US. Uh, for instance, the, the comparatively high level of confidence uh, that the American atheists have are, are matched by the general population confidence, right? So it's not that atheists are somehow more certain, uh, or, you know, the sort of arrogant atheist trope in their views. Now, so the question of configurations, of what configurations of beliefs and unbeliefs do we find? So. Unbelief in God doesn't necessarily entail unbelief in these other supernatural phenomena. So here are the questions that we asked, or the items that we asked people to rate their agreement on. So there is some sort of life after death. Sometime after I die, I expect that I'll be born again in another body. Uh, there exist supernatural beings who might be good, evil, or neither, such as, and then we, ha we varied this by country based on our, our local work of what might be the most appropriate items there. Uh, the positions of stars and planets affect people's lives. Some people have mystical powers to heal, harm, or bring good luck. Some objects have mystical powers to heal, harm, or bring good luck. There are underlying forces of good and evil in this world. There exists a universal spirit or life force. There is a power in the universe that causes good things to happen to people who behave morally and bad things to happen to people who behave immorally. Our most significant life events are meant to be and happen for a reason. So we were interested in the extent to which people who don't think there is a God think these things either exist or are true. So we find that unbelief in God doesn't necessarily entail unbelief in these other uh, phenomena. Perhaps you might expect that. And only minority, quite small minorities of atheists and agnostics in each country appear to be thoroughgoing naturalists who say they disagree with all of those things. So just uh, broadly, we say the atheists, so that's the percentage of the, um, the sample that, that uh, either strongly agreed or somewhat agreed with these items. So you can see that the agnostics are a bit higher, and then the general population, these ideas are actually pretty prevalent where you can see those differences. So there would be a lot to talk about there, but just a few things to, to pull out um, is that um, beliefs that there are underlying forces of good and evil, that there exists a universal spirit or life force, and that most significant life events are meant to be and happen for a reason, are the most endorsed amongst ones and twos globally. And second, amongst our atheists in particular, uh, the Japanese are the least, and Brazilian and Chinese the most, I'd say, supernaturally inclined. So it's the, the, the yellow line here at the bottom is the Japanese sample, so pretty consistently beneath the other countries in terms of their uh, levels of, of credence in these things. Uh, but then you could compare that to the Chinese agnostics, which are by far the, seem to be the most supernaturally inclined of all of the, the groups. And then, I mean, that's Chinese astrology right there it ends up being quite, quite high. Um, so this collapses those. So beyond the individual questions, we we're interested in naturalism. So some might say if you consider unbelief in the existence of God to be the result of a certain type of, rash, of scientific rationalism, then perhaps it would mean a lack of belief in these other things as well. But what we find is the number of people who 
say that they disagree with all of those things is quite low. So the left-hand side of each graphic are the percentages amongst uh, the ones, the atheists, and on the right-hand side, the agnostics. So you can see that the, the largest group here is the, the U.S. sample, where the American atheists, 35 percent of the U.S. ones are what we would call naturalist, in the sense of naturalist versus supernaturalist. Right. Uh, whereas China, uh, it's it's quite low, right? So the you can say in the in terms of the Chinese twos, uh, so the agnostics, only two percent of that sample ended up being thoroughgoing naturalist, right? So you find some interesting variance there. Now, in terms of worldviews and values, we do have relevant questions for for all of these. Uh, we haven't analyzed all that yet, so I can speak to. Uh, some aspects of worldviews in this space. So there's a lot of talk for centuries, right, about the implications on other aspects of one's worldview and values if one does not have a belief in the existence of a god. So one of them that people talk about is where does meaning come from? Is there any ultimate meaning? Can there be any ultimate function or meaning to the universe in the absence of a, of a creator who, who does these things? So this is the proportions of atheists and agnostics on the left-hand side for each country uh, and the general population on the right-hand side who uh, strongly agree or mostly agree with the item, the universe is ultimately meaningless, right? So that, those are the, the figures for, for that. Um, and there's some variation across countries, uh, but a few things stand out, right? So in no country survey does the proportion of either unbelievers or the general population who affirm a meaningless universe reach 50%. It's always under half in any of the groups that we, we look at. With the exception of, of Brazil, where 47% of unbelievers endorse the view, it's only about a third or so of unbelievers in most of the countries who regard the universe to be ultimately meaningless. And second, while unbelievers are more likely to take this view than the general population, that relationship is reversed in Japan, and I don't quite know why yet. I gave a talk in Japan about this and solicited opinions and still confused <laughs> about this, <laughs> as, as was my audience. Uh, so it'd be interesting to, to, to see that uh, going forward, how we analyze that. Uh, perhaps one of the, the most debated implications of unbelief in the existence of God concern morality and values. So in relation to moral relativism and objectivism, we ask participants to rate their agreement with the statement, what is right and wrong is up to each person to decide. So our findings suggest no consistent difference between unbelievers and the general population. So percentages agreeing with this statement range from 41% uh, among the general population of China to 60% among the general population of Brazil. And unbelievers are more likely to endorse that statement in China and the US. It's members of the general population that are more likely to endorse that statement in Brazil, Denmark, Japan, and the UK. Right, so there seems to be no consistent uh, relationship there. So if one takes a strongly deterministic view of the effect of one's belief in God on one's stance on moral relativism, that appears to be unjustified, uh, I would say, with this uh, data. So next on to uh, human rights. So in human dignity and the objective existence of human rights, uh, are unbelievers well, they seem to be uh, typically less likely to affirm these than the general population. Although Denmark and the US, it's just about the same. And in all countries and all groups, the affirmation of dignity and human rights is the majority position. The, the statement there, if you can't read it, is all human beings, regardless of where they are born, are born with dignity and a special set of rights. So I don't know if any of you follow like John Evans's work. So he's very interested in different anthropologies, views that people have of humankind and whether you have a theological vision or a biological vision of human beings, this will affect the extent to which you um, commit to and endorse and want to support human rights. Um, so that's the, the data we have there. And in relation to the environmental uh, discussion we've been having, we have a sort of question on deep ecology. So in relation to the deep value of the natural world regarding, regardless of its usefulness to humans, in half of the countries surveyed, so that's Denmark, the UK, and the US, our unbelievers in our general samples endorse it at near identical levels. And in the other half, that's Brazil, China, and Japan, unbelievers were, were less likely to endorse the statement. Uh, 
went from 82% to 89% in Brazil, 77 to 93 in China, and 55 to 79 in Japan. So now this one's quite interesting. We're actually doing some follow-up work on this as well. So beyond the sort of worldviews question of do you sign up to an ism of some kind, are you a transhumanist, are you Marxist, or whatever, that people you know, weave together different elements that they find meaningful in their own lives or in the world and create sort of personalized worldviews of what makes life and the universe meaningful. So we asked people to uh, look at this question. When it comes to finding meaning in the world and in your own life, which of the following are most important to you? Please select the five items that are most important to you. And we gave this list of 43. Uh, I'll give you a minute and take, take the time to, to think of these. I was very happy as a researcher that in the comments that we opened up at the end of the survey, that people commented on this question to say, that was really hard. Uh, and it would take, you know, I'm, I'm taking this for money and, you, you know, normally I want to uh, move on to the next survey, but this made me take 20 minutes, you know, or it made, made me do something on this in terms of taking time. Um, so that was encouraging that folks were in, engaging with the, the, the topic, but it can be quite difficult. And further, we actually had them uh, rate the top five, they had to rank them one to five. So we made it even more difficult in the next, the next stage, right? I don't have that data yet to, to show. Um, but so here, here's what we found. So what we found really was uh, a lot of agreement. Uh, so despite all items, all 43 of those items were chosen by at least one person in each country. Uh, we found very high levels of agreement. Out of the possible 43 options, only 14 made it into this overall top five for any group of the general population or unbelievers per country. Um, so family was the most frequently chosen item in all the general population samples and in four of the six unbeliever samples. Further, where it was not the most uh, frequently chosen item, it either came second in Brazil or third in China. And freedom uh, was also frequently chosen across all samples. It was the most frequently chosen item by Brazilian and Chinese unbelievers, ranked second behind family in half of our samples, and it never fell out of the top five. Other items that, that frequently make appearances here are compassion, truth, nature, science, friendship, and equality, in terms of the things that people are really grabbing onto as saying that these are, are most important uh, to us. Right. But so what we noticed there is, you know, the top line in each country being the ones and twos and the, uh, the bottom line being the general population in, in each of the countries. Uh, not a ton of difference, especially at the far left end. A lot more uniting people in their visions of the world than not. Um, so there's much, I mean, there's so much data. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad other people are, are trolling through it and I get to uh, see the fruits of their labor uh, <laughs> while, I'm, while I'm doing other things. Uh, but our, our preliminary data, I think, contradict common suppositions about the nature of, of unbelief. So atheists and agnostics in general do not appear to differ much from the general population and their level of confidence in their belief slash unbelief, whether they see morality as objective or relative in many of the domains of their values values and worldviews, say, on human rights, nature, importance of family, and freedom. And not all are scientific rationalist naturalists. In fact, not very many are. And the majority express some belief in at least one of the supernatural entities or processes that we identified. So I, I look then at the sort of discourse surrounding all things atheism and religion. And you have these camps that it's perhaps in their interest to create narratives of opposition and radical otherness amongst the others that are a threat of some kind, right? Uh, but those are, just as in the wider political landscape, are often tools for people to grab power or influence or money. Uh, it might be the case that the, the two tribes sort of idea is actually less uh, tied to, to the reality of the situation. I don't know if anyone's seen this graphic on the far right before with the, uh, the blue and the red. So those are uh, votes in common in the U.S. House of Representatives from, I think it's, oh, wow, it's too blurry on the screen. Uh, I think it's 1949, yeah, to 2011. So that when it's, there's overlap, that's where the Democrats and the Republicans are voting the same on an issue. 
And so you can just see over time these two groups becoming further and further apart to where it's almost unheard of for Republicans and Democrats to vote the same on, on a common issue. So this is something that's not just in the religious space, right? It's, it's affecting all of our societies, this type of polarization and claims of radical difference, which at least our data suggests that uh, meet those claims with perhaps some skepticism. And when you get out and talk to people and ask about what they care about and what their values are, there may be as much that unites us as, as divides us, really. Uh, so many thanks uh, to, to Lori and the Non-Religion in a Complex Future uh, Project, uh, to the JTF for funding us, and St. Mary's and Natson for helping out with the report. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, John. I think we have um, a good bit of time for questions, actually, at least a little bit. Uh, questions, comments? Uh, yeah, Linda. Thank you very much. Just a general point about the analysis. Uh, if you're trying to show that unbelievers and non-unbelievers, let's coin that term, are quite similar, um, would it be better to, on all the graphs to compare those two groups? Because the general population includes a few heap of, un of unbelievers. In some countries, yes. In China, yeah. by the way. So why did you, why did you put general population rather than just comparing believers and unbelievers? That is a great question. My original vote when the project was coming together was to compare right. believers and, and right. non-believers primarily. Uh, I was overruled by a majority uh, in the in the project. Where I think it's is it the case that the the ones and the twos are different? in some way from everybody else in this population. Some, I mean, you made this, this point yesterday in your own discussion, so I think this is a, a starting point. Uh, one could do a follow-up analysis where, except our, our general population sample is smaller, so in the countries where it is a non-religious majority, or, or say a majority of people that are threes through sevens, uh, there might not be enough right. variants there to really get at it. So the, the point of this really was to try to dig down into this population that can be identified on previous social research, but not in a lot of detail. So we really did want to expend our sample size mainly on the ones and the twos. Uh, so we don't have quite as many of the, uh, of the others to make those sorts of uh, broader comparisons, uh, but we think that the, the general population can, can do well enough for that. But I agree, it's, it's something to, to potentially follow up with. I'm assuming you were using online panels for this. Can you just talk a little bit more about the methodology? Uh, you mentioned the quota uh, sampling as well. Yes, yeah. So this was a Qualtrics panels service is what we used. Uh, so we, we talked to a few different companies, YouGov and a few others, but Qualtrics was giving the best combination of, of price, although they, it was expensive, uh, and, uh, and saying that they could do it. Uh, and so once we had access to, to China through a local collaborator who could do the interviews and was happy to work with us extensively on the translations and conceptualization and the problems that come doing this type of research in China, uh, then the other advantage of Qualtrics was they said, oh, we will gather data in China. We do have that ability. Whereas YouGov said, we've been told we cannot do that. Uh, so that was a part of how that was, was chosen. And then, yeah, just in terms of quotas, we looked at the existing um, I surveys and said, okay, in the, the World Values Survey of the ISSP for these countries, the, for the demographic profile of the ones and twos is that they are 60% male, 40% female in one country, 55, 45 in another, so that we set up those quotas to get this sample to say what we're saying about Denmark here uh, does fit the demographic profile of what's coming out of the, the group. So you wouldn't want to say, hey, if the if it's 70% male, 30% female unbelievers in a country and your sample's 80% women, that's not going to be representative of unbelievers in that country. Uh, so we, we wanted to, I mean, ideally include more quotas, but that got prohibitively expensive, so we had to limit it to three. And after a discussion of whether SES was going to be one of the three, we settled on region, age, and sex. Yes. My question has to do with the chosen of equality and freedom. Of course, this comes I'm, sc I'm sorry, can you so say? The, the, the way we people used to choose yes. equality and freedom, yes. that of course are in many ways anti bias uh -huh. many different things. So two, two questions. One, if the interviews go, we go on deeper than that. And the second question, just to, to the counter-interpretation, couldn't be because of the antagonistic nature of those concepts, like freedom and equality, 
that's the reason they're chosen, not because they represent themselves, themselves the same to all of them, but because they are two really contested kind of concepts, that's the reason people tend to choose different definitions. Uh, so this is a great question on, so we've got these concepts here, we've got these terms, what do they mean? I mean, for all survey research, it's, what do you mean by God? What do you mean by belief? What do you mean by X? Freedom and equality, what do they mean, right? So the, the, the interviews do go into this, we do have a bit of discussion, but the follow-up study we're doing right now, I'm sorry, I forgot to, to mention it, addresses this head on. So there's a, there's a technique in the discipline of cognitive anthropology called free listing and cultural domain analysis. And what that involves is that you, you list one of these terms that you have that's interesting to you, so say family or freedom, and you say, what are the first things that come to mind when I say this term? And you say you have a list maybe of five to 10 lines, and people give you their, their lists, right? Once you get about 30 people in a population, the amount of new information you're getting is very low. So you start to get a cultural model of the way people are conceiving of, a sort of semantic map of what are the most common associations with this, this topic. So with something like, uh, uh, well, so the, 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 the comparison that I'd normally use when talking about this is romantic love. So in the United States, when you ask people about romantic love and name the associations that you have with it, a lot of the associations in the top 10 have to do with commitment and long-term relationships. Right, so I mean, there's a lot of overlap between countries, but commitment, long-term stuff, really high up on those lists. Go to Lithuania, ask the same question about romantic love, you have a lot of, you have a fair amount of overlap. Very little of the long-term commitment stuff is there, especially in the top 10, and you get a lot of the fiery, emotional torment of a love affair, <laughs> and the fact that it's temporary and it will fade away. So this idea that you have to tie love to this long-term relationship rather than being two people caught up in this amazingly crazy experience. So it's a lot of like holding hands, walks on the beach, romantic dinner, this kind of stuff. And stuff about marriage and long-term commitment is way further down the list. So you could start to build a, a map of the concept and how people think about it. So we are now running that methodology for all of these concepts. For, for each group, so we'll be able to compare general population uh, in Brazil and unbelievers in Brazil for their conception of freedom. So you'll be able to see what is in the, what are the sort of top key salient bits. Oh, when you do the analysis of that, it's what gets uh, uh, chosen most frequently, but then also how early in the list it comes. So if the word is the first out of somebody's mouth when you say freedom, we say that's more core to that idea. So there's a technique called Smith's S, so that's the, the stat that comes out of this, where you combine the frequency that it, with which something is mentioned with its how early it often comes in the list. So then you say this is the salience of this, this topic, right? So this way we would be able to say for, we're doing this for God, uh, religion, atheism, uh, I'm throwing in human just because, uh, and then all of these items, and we're running that in all the countries just now. So hopefully that would be able to speak to your, your question. Yeah, this is kind of like a follow-up. So if we can go back to the list of the terms that you provided respondents yep. with. So was there an effort when you guys were coming up with this list to kind of, you know, we're talking about values that are shared, that you have a good sense are probably shared by most people, and then ones that might be more controversial, like say reproductive rights. So did you try and balance that list between those who might be kind of be show more of the kind of what people share in common versus the ones that we kind of know from existing literature are more contentious between kind of unbelievers and especially active uh, religious populations. Um, or just generally, uh, what was the reasoning behind providing a list versus just providing an open short-ended question and then do running like a, a crunch with, with algorithms afterwards to kind of group code these together and, and kind of yeah, no, it's a great question methodologically. This question did come in very late in the game in terms of the design. So it, it, from a cognitive anthropological perspective, this is a sin. And that what we should have done was to... Uh, my, my, my nice Canadian way of saying that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we don't formulate a question like this. Yeah, so what you would do is in each country do the list of what things matter and then it, put them in the list, right? So it would all be generated yeah, from folks. leaving it open if you're not sure what well, so that, yeah, that presents a, a much trickier analysis when you're talking about 6,700 well, people. Well, but now we have the technology to do that now, right? Like, we didn't have it 
Ago. Okay, so I didn't think anybody in our team knew how to use that technology. It's perhaps the, the perhaps the the issue, and uh, so w w I th what I remember doing in relation to this was uh, the things that popped up amongst our core group uh, as things that we heard and talking to people in this space that they had said. And then we circulated out, like, Lori, I think you were involved in this email chain. We circulated it out to all the people who had received subgrants on our project to say, in your work, what are we missing in relation to this? Uh, so we, we, you know, it's the things that you often hear from humanist and atheist groups saying, we believe in X, Y, and Z. It was a sort of starting point. But then by asking people who worked outside of those contexts, we got... I think a much fuller list. So certainly not comprehensive and not perfect, but I think still still instructive in its in its own way. You see, like that, for example, mm. the use of human rights here as using that as a general like human rights. Not many people are going to be against human rights, but if you break that down to like religious freedom and sexual orientation rights, that's when you might see more of a distinction, right? So like, okay, I'm yeah, wondering but, if uh, like, expression gears towards showing um, commonalities, which you know is important. I, I, I appreciate the findings, um, but also might then mask differences. Okay, I, perhaps I'm not following. Uh, yeah. it, it's not that we're asking each of these, we're not presenting each of these and then getting a rating. No, no, it's that you present the whole list. Right, but you get the whole the list and then, you get to, and then you get to pick the, the top it's five. What you on that list. So it's, it's very common for people to say, no, I believe in human rights yeah, yeah. As, a, as a worldview item. It's yeah. much less common to say, I believe in some subsection yeah. of human rights as an identity marker or as something for a large scale meaning making enterprise. So we could have gone common, more, right? Right? Yeah. yeah, so it's, it's like the, common, the, the commonness is almost assumed the way the question is asked. Yeah, so I guess there were some assumptions there based on uh, if you how fine grained you go with it, the relevance to the sample might be quite low. But I think I think that's how probably that how we're doing. Super interesting. Okay. No, thank you for that. I'm wondering, did you get any interesting responses to the other category the writings? Um. I had spent one weekend of my life reading <laughs> all of those and all of the comments at the end of the surveys uh, in all different languages using Google Translate. Uh, and uh, it's kind of blending together in, in my mind at this moment. I think what I think what was most often the case there is rather than something that we missed that people went on about, it was a chance to comment on something that was here that they didn't know that there was going to be an open comment box at the end, and they wanted to expound on this question, and they said, oh, text box, yeah. yummy, let's go for that. Yeah. Uh, so that, that was what I remembered was talking about these types of things. Yes? Jonathan, this is a good question, a follow-up, I think, on Sarah's question. <clears throat> if you were asking for the top five, could it be that the differences that they're looking for are not on the top five? Certainly. So yeah. if you, you know, have a chance to dig down, we might find some fairly sizable differences on some of the other items here. That's, yeah. uh, presenting the whole list gives the impression that you've covered up values, but you've only covered up the top five. Yes, because once you get out of, say, the top well, depending on how many people you include and how, <clears throat> how much agreement there is about these topics, yeah. the you might be talking, by the time you get down to like number 12 on those lists, you might be talking about one person, right, who listed it somewhere on their, their, their item. So it's, uh, so how really meaningful is that? So most of the time there's, when people are analyzing this with the Smith's S, there's a curve and there's normally a, a sort of key moment where they say, okay, anything beyond this point is really not that meaningful. So that's why it's normally the top five or top eight or something like that. And depending on each data set of where that curve lies is where you would make that, that cutoff. So a rating on each one was really not doing right? I'm sorry? A rating on each item or something? Oh, yeah. So we were dealing with time constraints of right. online panels. Uh, and, yeah, so we, we thought the, this would generate, th you know, a lot of thought yeah. as people had to prioritize things that they're like, I like all these words. How on earth am I going to, to, to pick some of what, what, what is the most important one, one for me or the top, the top few, right? Yeah, so t time constraints is part of that. Yes. I consider as, asking the bottom five the least important five or no? Yeah. Oh, so what things are least important to you? Yeah. Yeah. No, from, uh, from 
Oh, out of the list. Oh, yeah. very interesting. Yeah. Another way is also like list all the ones that are positive to you, just click on them, and then all the ones that are negative connotations yeah. to you, and then just do like cluster analyses. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, no, two, two very good methodological ideas of how to explore that space more. Yeah. Yeah, which ones are, are less important? No, very cool. Uh, thanks for that uh, interesting stuff. I'm surprised that you use kami um, to translate God into Japanese because they, they seem like apples and oranges to me. Um, like, as far as I understand Japanese religion, kami is more like um, ancestor or saint um, rather than deity. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I just, you know, if, if one maybe wonder how much did you involve scholars from non weird countries in the design of things? In all, okay. all of them. Uh, so two two answers to your question. Uh, one is that we didn't make that decision to use Kami. That's what is used in the World Value Survey in the ISSP. Uh, so it's to dialogue with pre-existing data. So to say, here's what the World Value Survey says is this population that they've identified, but we have questions about what's underneath that population. So we could just say, yell at them for making a bad decision. And the, so we we're just sort of following on with that. Uh, so that like that's the that's the easy cop out question. But there is a more our serious response to to your question, which is that uh, the term kami, as I've found it in my time in Japan and discussing with people who study Japanese religions, uh, is used for the Judeo-Christian God as well. Uh, especially, as I, I said, if you, when you ask about kami in the survey, and so we'll see this in the free list, right? When we free list the term kami in Japan, which we're doing, uh, sky, uh, old man with beard, all kinds of Judeo-Christian type stuff appear. Uh, in those those lists. I mean, some other things appear as well, but for some people it's like, research project asking me about kami, I think they're talking about some sort of deep, like, large-scale monotheistic kind of deity, right? Like, that language is used uh, in, in Japan. Uh, but kami, it's, I mean, scholars of Japanese religion have been arguing about this for, for decades, where it's, you know, really uh, it can be anything that provokes awe or reverence in one's environment. Uh, that can be designated as as kami. It can be a, for a person who's deceased. It might be uh, an, an artifact that we utilize that helps us in our everyday life that we wish to, to uh, give thanks to. Uh, all of those things are, are there. Uh, but so the, the term's not uh, limited just to be like, say, an indigenous term again, and not to be uh, associated with the God concept. In the minds of a lot of Japanese people, it is. At least as I, it's something that I, I found. Yes. I have another response to your list here. Okay. Uh, I, I feel like there's an assumption that people are stable over time. Uh -huh. And it might be really interesting to ask uh, 10 years ago, mm -hmm. you get some kind of reference. I mean, uh, this is imagining what could be possible. But to get some, like, 10 years ago or. Um, uh, in your adolescence, what was important, or mm. you know, just because I I'm not sure that these things are stable. Mm. Uh, no, I think, I think that's a great point. So in our, our interviews, we do ask people not about each question because there are too many too too many questions, but uh, for the the general sort of God question, we do ask about change over time and the development of those things. Um, yeah, but no, I think that's a great point. I do think these things change over time. It's pretty clear, especially, we'll say, like the family item, depending on what one's status is with one's family and whether one is coupled or uncoupled or in family or not, that that might change, you know, uh, depending on uh, where one is in one's life stage, right? Uh, no, so very, very much agree with that. Maybe structure wrap up? I'm sure John would be happy to. Um, continue the conversation over lunch. Uh, it, is, uh, it is lunchtime. I, I just want to say again, thank you so much for coming and sharing the results, what you, what you have so far. Mm -hmm. This is Solange uh, said to me um, when I saw her in the quarter outside, she said, does everyone know that uh, you have a website and these things are available online? So we should... Oh, yes. Yeah, so the... Uh, oops. Oh, sorry. It's earlier in there. 
the report. I've, and I've got three other copies. You've got one copy. I've got three copies with me in case folks are. Um, and, and I wanted to say personally, thank you for involving me in the project. It was a pleasure to be a little bit on the margins of it, but uh, enough that I was able to keep track of what you were up to. And it's an amazing, uh, amazing project. And I think the, the questions here indicate um, the fact that others in the room think so too. Uh, really, really grateful. And we'll look forward to your continued putting the results up on the website so we can keep engaged with what you're doing that way as well. And Run some publications, hopefully, as soon as we well, get Well, I mean, you know, but those are slower. So <laughs> yeah. um, thanks very much, John, for coming today. No, thank you all. It's great questions. Thank you. Thank you.